the perspective of a bow hunter from England and the challenges they face and why we got to pay attention to it. Here we go. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, the host, and I'm coming at you from the Broken Tine Studio right here in Clark Fork, Idaho. And I am super happy about uh, you guys being here in this episode. We've got a, I've got a really good one lined up for you. Uh, my guest today is, his name is Kenneth Bartlett, and he lives over in England and uh, is was really interested in sharing his perspective kind of with what they have faced in the past with anti-hunting organizations and movements and uh, legislative actions taken uh, by these groups over it uh, where he calls home. And I think that it's important perspective for all of us to kind of pay attention to because I think that sometimes we think that it can't happen here in the States or in Canada, uh, but it can. And it's a slow bleed out death and and that's what kind of we talk about in this episode and i think you're gonna you're gonna get some interesting perspective out of this so um again welcome thank you for being here i'm really excited so i i do have a couple things to cover the first off is i want to take a moment and just recognize uh, a, a past guest we've had on this show um passed away and he is one of those human beings that kind of comes into your life. Every, you know, you, you, everybody has this. They have somebody that comes into their life and makes just this huge impact on us. And that's what Dr. Valerius Geist did to me. Uh, Dr. Geist passed away last week. And the, the hard part for me is I kind of became friends with this man who has been a scientist of wildlife and studying ecological and biological wildlife management tools, all, all these things his, his entire life. I mean, he's been doing this forever. I, I believe he was 83. Uh, and he came on the show last fall, and we discussed all sorts of things. From And, and just so, for those of you that don't know, he is one of the authors of the North American model of wildlife conservation and um, he discussed that a little bit on the show but mainly what we talked about is a lot of things regarding like mule deer and whitetail cohabitation and then the effects of wolves and and the lack of wolf management and predator management in general in that episode and I can't for the life of me remember what number of episode that was but I believe it was from October of 2020 uh, I had Dr. Geist on, and it is a just an eye-opening, fantastic episode. And if you haven't heard it, you should go back and listen to that one because you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, and that's just how Dr. Geist was. He just had the information. He had the theories. Some of them were proven. Some of them have not been proven. Some of them were debunked, and, and he was always open to that. If he did a study and figured out some behavioral aspect of, of our wildlife, like a bighorn sheep, for example. And he came to this theory, uh, and somebody else did conducted another study and kind of debunked his theory. Instead of digging in, digging in his heels and, and trying to defend his disproven theory, uh, he would congratulate the, the people or organization that kind of debunked his theory um, and and would tell them about how what, what what a great study it was and what a great piece of research and and congratulations on on learning this information and sharing it with everybody. He was just a beautiful beautiful man. And and I I would say that 
what what saddens me the most is I feel like not enough people heard from Dr. Valerius Geist. I feel like they they didn't we didn't get enough of him, and it, it's not that for the a lack of effort on his part, but Dr. Geist has been doing this since the 1960s, right? And so he's been doing this since before all the social media and YouTube and all these channels of information that we all enjoy uh, in this day and age, and so. I feel like it's out there, but it, it hasn't been marketed well enough, and it's not out there enough that everybody was able to kind of take a bite of it, and everybody should, because Dr. Geist knows his stuff. He knows wildlife management. He knows biology and the ecology of things and all the things that go into our landscapes from conservation to public lands to uh, wildlife management to hunting seasons to growing antlers on deer in Texas. I mean, this guy is was just a wealth of information, and I'm honored to have known him. Uh, and I would encourage all of you to do what you can to read some of his writings. He's written some excellent books. Um, read his books. Uh, you know, read his stuff online that's been put out there. He's been on a couple of podcasts, I know, um, and and obviously on this one. And I just feel like the world has lost uh, a wonderful human being with an excellent heart. In um, to Dr. Valerius Geist, uh, you know, if there's uh, any way you're listening out there, I sure appreciate you for your contribution to our our way of uh, conservation and wildlife management out there. So guys, that's that. And and, and again, I, I was like, I, I just, man, broken hearted over that, that news. I was really hoping to get him back on. There was other things I wanted to kind of pick his brain about. And um, anyways, that is that. And uh, the world is emptier because of the loss for, for Dr. Geist. So, um, all right, guys, getting back to a couple of other topics just real quick. Um, I was hoping I could talk you guys into writing us a review on Apple iTunes or, or Podbean. If you're listening and you enjoy the show and, and you'd recommend it to somebody else, um, if you wouldn't mind doing that, I would really, really appreciate it. We're, we, I've got this weird thing where I'm not really great at social media. I'm not really great at uh, doing like this marketing thing, but it... Apparently, it really helps the show, and and we haven't had any reviews written in a while. Um, and if you guys like it, you know, I and and you wouldn't mind helping out the show, and you believe in the cause of the Western Huntsman, uh, please jump on and write us a review. And, and again, that's going to be on like Apple Podcasts or iTunes, uh, or you can do it on Podbean. If you listen on Podbean, uh, that's another good spot. I had one bad review written on uh, for us on Podbean, and and so. I'd like to counter that one if possible. Now, if you don't like it, don't jump on there and write a review. Don't worry about it. Just don't. It'll be our secret. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I, I do. I, I'd appreciate it, guys. Even if you just jump on there and give us a, a five star rating or whatever, um, that really helps. If if you wouldn't mind, jump on there and check that out. Uh, the other thing I haven't been talking about lately is. Uh, if you go to the westernhuntsman.com and you go either to the gear or the merchandise shop, all proceeds on that. Um, that, that we generate off of that, a portion of that gets donated to conservation efforts. And we were, I had kind of a July 1 cutoff for the Sportsman's Alliance, but I, I, I want to see that get a little bit bigger. We're only at like $193 or something like that uh, to donate to them. And I'd, I'd really like to hit, my, my goal is like 300 bucks. And so if you guys buy a t-shirt or a mug or a sticker, or you jump on the gear side and buy any of the Tacticam products that we have, um, that all helps go to that, and that helps all of us. Because Sportsman's Alliance, they are fighting out there, and they're doing a great job for us. And, and I'm, I'm a real huge supporter of that organization, and I think that they're one of those silent organizations that more people need to be aware of because I don't think a lot of people know what they do behind the scenes. So definitely check that out if you guys are interested in, like, a cool T-shirt or something like that. Um, it's all – we started by just having the public land T-shirt – going to, towards conservation but now it's it's all all of it everything that you could buy on the westernhuntsman.com has a has a a designated portion i i'd say a number but it varies depending on what you buy uh because there's different profit margins in each of those and so we have to break that down so that it all hits you know make sure we're at least trying to run um somewhat profitable around here <laughs> with all the expenses so um 
so that varies. So anyways, a portion varying de- depending on what you buy is going to be donated uh, for the next month or two towards Sportsman's Alliance. And then I have another organization in mind that I want to transfer that to once we get to that point. Okay, enough of that. So just to recap, write us a review. And if you guys are interested in helping get some money raised for Sportsman's Alliance, jump on West- thewesternhuntsman.com. And go into the gear shop or the merchandise and get you something that you'd be interested in. All right, guys. With that, let's get into it with Kenneth Bartlett. Again, he's out of England, and he's got an interesting perspective as to how um, hunting has changed in Europe and and specifically in in England and the United Kingdom and kind of how he has seen that transform over the years and and what it's left him with now uh, and, and how restricted they are and i am worried that that could happen here in the states and in canada and in, uh, just north america in general if we are not paying attention and so that's why i brought kenneth on because he could shed some light on that so without further ado guys thank you so much for all the support out there god bless dr valerius geist we are sure gonna miss you let's get into it with kenneth bartlett and here we go All right, guys, this week on the line, I've got Kenneth Bartland all the way from England joining me to talk all things hunting and bow hunting, and, and uh, we're going to hit on uh, a lot of different topics here. And uh, just uh, as, a, as a public service announcement, I'm recording this from my truck because the studio is not yet complete out here uh, where I'm at. So uh, hopefully the sound doesn't come through too bad from uh, my truck here, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll kick this off. Kenneth, I appreciate you joining me. How you doing? Uh, very well, thank you, Jim. Um, a good morning um, to you and your um, your podcast listeners. Um, belated best wishes for um, a happy fourth um, on the fifth of July. And um, yes, I fully appreciate the irony of having a British bow hunter um, the the day <laughs> after the fourth of July. But certainly, I think that for what Jim and I have been discussing in terms of freedoms to hunt wherever you are in the world, um, regardless of your own politics, are still it's still a very, very important subject. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's I think that the the really unique thing about what we're gonna be able to cover today, Kenneth, is the um, the dynamics that you have experienced in England and, and all of Europe really. Uh, and and to put that into kind of a, a, a perspective that people here in the states can maybe bite into a little bit more, so that uh, it helps us understand what threats do exist, and and that's a big that's a big part of our show. So we're going to get to all that. Um, let's kick us off by can you tell us a little bit about like where are you at? I know so for for those of you listening, it's it's almost noon here in North Idaho. Uh, and it is, I believe, what, almost 8 o'clock your time? Yep, that's right, Jim. P.M. Yep, um, here in um, yeah, 8 p.m. in uh, east of England. Um, so, again, I fully appreciate the the time differences. Um, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm okay with um, time differences in as much that a number of my colleagues um, – we work um, for my employer are based in um, uh, offices in the East Coast. So again, five hours behind, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So again, um, you guys sort of being even further. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm on Pacific time. Yep, yep. We're up. Uh, we're on Pacific time up here in the Panhandle. So, uh, did you? Right. So did you grow up in East England? And and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, certainly. Um, I I grew up. Um, I was born at an early age, um, and I I grew up in East Anglia and went away to um, agricultural college to um, read a degree in um, landed estate management. Um, 
and I qualified as a rural practice um, surveyor. It effectively, um, if you like, um, both a real tour in terms of buying, selling and letting agricultural and rural property, but also in terms of um, a, a sort of a um, offering rural business management consultancy services. Oh, okay. And um, I pursued that career for a number of years. Um, in fact, I, I ended up working for um, some years in Parliament Square, of which um, we'll, I will talk a little bit more later on. But certainly, um, we'll, I, was, um, I was working at uh, the Royal Institution of um, Chartered Surveyors, which is directly opposite the Houses of Parliament themselves. Um, and I was there for a number of years. Um, so I was effectively the rural practice chartered surveyors man on the inside, as it were. And um, I greatly enjoyed that position. But then, you know, um, as um, I think it was Thomas Edison said, only change is constant. So yeah. um, I made a move, um, went into... Um, my own um, private consultancy um, work and um, swings and roundabouts. I, um, I ended up in um, the far south of um, the Republic of Ireland. Um, I was in County Cork for a number of years um, where, um, I mean, hunting with hounds especially is um, dyed in the wool. Um, you can you can go hunting quite literally seven days a week. Oh, um, you know, it's, it, yeah. Oh yeah. If you went, if you went to some of the, um, uh, just think that um, the housing projects in Cork city, you know, early enough on a, on a Sunday morning, you will hear hounds baying because what they do is they'll have one, each of the, the guys who hunts with a particular um, pack of hounds, they will hovel one or two of their own hounds, which they will then meet at the rendezvous with all um, with all their um, friends, mm -hmm. and then you know they'll hunt the hounds together. Um, and so that was that was quite a you know um, again it's it's all hunting, but it's just a, a different flavour. And yeah. then came back across this side of the, the water um, in. 08 and again um, found myself working for a, um, a um, global pharmaceutical um, clinical research organization um, again not my um, field of expertise um, as a um, rural and agricultural realtor but certainly in terms of having um, negotiated and executed any number of um, contracts. This sort of transferable skills enabled me to get my legs under the table, and um, you know I've been um, I've been working as a, a site contract specialist oh, um, for the past um, for the past seven years. So oh, wow. Uh, wow. again, um, wh what's useful is that. Um, I can sort of, I can fit my hunting around um, the work that I'm doing, so that I'm um, I'm not living to work. I'm working to live. So yeah. um, for yeah. that, um, you know, that 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 is important. My darling wife Sarah, she does not work on a Wednesday or a Saturday, so that both of us know that between us, we can get at least two days out with the hounds during any one week. So, huh. so and, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. You know, it, and again, that sort of pretty much, and um, well, I'm, I'm the wrong side of 50 now. And I would say I've been hunting, um, been hunting with foot beagles, the infantry, if you like, not the cavalry, um, <laughs> the, certainly 35 years. And again, it's one of these, some would say the purest end of the sport in that you're there for the hound work yeah. and um, 
see, seeing the hounds work um, with no distraction from whether the horse is going to fall on top of you, you can really, you know, pick out the, the subtle nuances of, you know, which hounds are sort of, um, you know, which hounds can um, pick up the scent. In, uh, you know, in particularly dry conditions, or if um, you know they sort of cross a very, um, you know, very lush um, grassland or er- anything like that, whether there's someone who sort of right at the back then sort of gets right to the head because they've got a you know much better nose, or if you've got ploughed land, what we call really cold scenting land, whether there's somebody that really does surprise you because you know they'll make their way right through the middle of the hounds and sort of start singing out and take the, you know, take the line forward. And, and yeah, I think it's it, every day you go out, you know, every day is a school day, you yeah. know, 35 years on, I'm still learning every time I go out. And I think that's an important, you know, important thing to bear in mind. That's yeah. that And that's the beauty with hunting is, is, is I think that's, it's like that for every hunter, uh, with the exception of those, you know, you always you always have those that uh, kind of act like they they know everything. They're not open to learning and, and and things of that nature. But that's a whole different story. So, Kenneth, like, give us a little bit of background in terms of how you got into hunting and and what because uh, I want to talk about the cultural aspect of it because in, in the states, in you know, as Americans, we always look at okay, hunting is a long you know, tradition, we've been uh, passing it down for generations, and can you give us a sense of how how is that similar or different to you being in England, and, and how culturally it was for you getting into hunting and growing up in within the sport if you did? Um, does, this, does this question, are, are you kind of getting what I'm, I'm getting at here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much so. And I think it is actually um, very appropriate that um, the day after the 4th of July, you know, when Americans are quite rightly celebrating their independence from the Redcoats, <laughs> and hundreds of years later, hundreds of years later, that, if you like, that totem, it has been one of the difficult um difficult images which foxhound packs especially uh-huh. have um have ha- had to deal with um in that you know red coats on horses tribal memories we're being downtrodden and subjugated by um you know um by the ruling classes and i think certainly um using that particular C word, the word class, I think that's where, um, in my experience, um, certainly when I make reference to, you know, hunting on foot with the beagles, everyone's on foot, you know, it's a great leveller. But regardless of, um, how shall I say, whether you're, you know, the country's richest duke or the country's... um, poorest um garbage um operative if you love your hunting i don't really care you know if you if you love watching hounds um do what they're bred to do um then that's fine by me um you see this you know i made reference to um um, across in ireland any number of the packs um, you have your sort of what we might call the sort of um, um, the what they call the county packs, like you have your uh, your county limerick foxhounds. But any other packs that sort of would hunt within the same county, there's a fair chance they wouldn't be wearing red coats mm-hmm. simply because it's it's that there's a world of difference between perception. And reality in that what people think they see and what they are actually seeing is that um, I know many folks, um, male and female, who work 
40 hours a day, eight days a week. I know that's an exaggeration, but that's so that they can keep horses, they can pay their subscriptions, um, they can afford to go hunting because that is what they want to do. And I think that is a, you know, that is something where certainly since um, I mean, the First World War um, changed um, changed the world a huge amount, and what wasn't changed during the First World War was changed after the Second World War, both in terms of what people expected from um, those that were um, those that they thought of as their equals and those um, who those who may have felt that they were superior um, whether they be politicians or um, you know certainly in this country um, members of the royal family and the aristocracy and yeah. again one thing I'm all conscious of is certain aspects um, will lose something in translation um, because you know any reference to the crown 4th of July 1776 that was that sure you know um, onwards and upwards um, and it's just something I think certainly where you look at continental Europe look at the French they had themselves um, a revolution but hunting with hounds is still as um, popular and as um, well maintained as it has been, you know, mm -hmm. obviously world wars notwithstanding. And I think because, and this is under um, notwithstanding, um, several socialist left wing governments who ordinarily, especially in a country such as England and the rest of the United Kingdom, would immediately say, ah, yeah, hunting the hounds, that is the. Um, that is the privilege of the upper classes, you know, as representatives of, you know, um, working classes, we cannot support this. Yeah. And certainly since the second war, that is what socialism in this country has done. They it, used the totem of the red coated toff on their horse as a totem, as everything that is, um, you know, everything that is wrong with um, not only hunting the hounds, but also um, centre and centre-right politics. Sure. And I'm, I mean, make, these, these are but observations. These are not, you know, they're my, my own personal views, not that of management. And it is, it, it's like the world's biggest onion. You peel away the, the thinnest layer of skin and you'll find another layer and so on. Mm -hmm. And but one there's one factor that joins all of us, whether you're your side of the water in nearly Canada, in very northern northern Idaho, and me here in the east of England, is our love of hunting. Whatever flavour, whatever weapon, whatever means of take, whatever quarry, it's it's that um um I'm just trying to remember the the quote um it was actually a fella um i know it's a that leon trotsky his mm -hmm. quote is them um, hunting acts like a poultice on the brain it's all absorbing yes trotsky wasn't exactly what you call center right but like that nice man engels a good friend of karl marx engels loved his hunting yeah. that is the irony that is the paradox and again, paradox, whether it's got a big P or a small P, paradox is what our opponents cannot get them, their heads round. That, yes, we are more than delighted when we have a successful hunt, whichever means of take or weapon we happen to be using, whatever the quarry. But we're just as delighted to be out in the field taking part. But at the same time, you know, as... Um, as um, Jim and I were discussing before um, we went on air, the drought that's hitting um, everything from the Rockies and, and westward, that will have significant 
impact on many species, not just quarry species, but yeah, it affects all everything. species because of particularly dry weather. Yep. So again, as as hunting people, we cannot uh, to use a double negative. We cannot not be concerned about that, mm-hmm. and that's where I think that we can hold our hands up. And I listened to a very good um, podcast with um, Donald Trump Jr. Um, on the Kafaru podcast with Aaron Snyder and Frank yep. Peralta, in which he he made reference to there being a world of difference between opponents of legal hunting being uh, prohibited from public land, that they were actually preservationists, not conservationists. Yeah. And yep. there, I I is a huge, there is a huge difference. I mean, um, some ooh, nearly 20 years ago, when I first went um, bow hunting in um, the very north of um, South Africa, um, the PH, a professional hunter, he, you know, we were having a, a chat around the fire um, one evening. We said that, you know, so many, so many people think that it's, you know, um, you know, if it's brown, it's down. It's the fact is, is that even um, it, everything is used. There's nothing goes to waste. That you know, if a if a client wants to go and take a hippo, fine, no problem at all. But there won't be a lot left of that hippo by the time the locals are coming pe- picked at it. Mm-hmm. And again, he was he he made the point very very um, clearly. A, a conservationist is a good animal. A preservationist is a bad animal. Yeah. And again, I think this idea that yes you will have wolves. Yes, you will have grizzly bears. The idea of putting even more of them into certain states, that's where it's going to start getting um, problematic. Granted, I cannot and will not comment because I'm not physically in North America, but um, certainly as someone who would have a more than passing interest, given that I'm you know, um, planning... Um, planning an archery elk hunt within the next couple of years or so. Sure. Yeah. yeah well, if, I mean, if the elk, if the elk. we we all know. You know, people listening to this show know that I I do not uh, stay quiet when I, when we're talking about grizzlies and 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 wolves and things like that. Yeah. But it, um, the the one thing I, I want to go back just a little bit, real quick. You yeah. You you keep making reference to uh you know left leaning right leaning kind of thing in 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 England yeah. or or in Europe is is hunting is it really divided by politics is like you know there's you have your right side that, that where you know these folks are hunters and they want to they want to promote hunting and get out there and and notch tags yeah. and then you have the opposing side is essentially kind of split down the middle as uh leaning liberal is that kind of how it is there Yes, um, it, it's interesting that um, you say that because um, certainly in this country, certainly from the, the first, uh, sorry, um, uh, from the second world onwards, immediately after the um, the, the second war um, in the late forties, the then socialist government decided, right, we've just you know we've just beaten, beaten the national socialists. I know, let's. Um, Let's have a bill to um, to ban hunting the hounds. And you thought, well, there's rather more to be done than getting one over on the um, you know the the gentry than just scoring a point by making making hunting illegal. Because if you go into Welsh Wales and up into um, up into um, the northwest, the northeast of England, up into um, up into the um, the southern part of Scotland, there are a there are um, many many working class folks who love hunting with hounds. Mm-hmm. And again, it's back to this paradox. This is why, if you look across the Channel at, um, at France since the Revolution, yeah, um, you've got um, I would call it a split down the middle. But again, you have certain 
you have certain parties which you know are going they're not they certainly wouldn't vote against hunting but you can't guarantee they would vote in favor of hunting Interesting. and i think that it's now got to the stage especially in this country here with boris johnson as our prime minister i you know i you know if i if i had purchased um a vote not that, that no sorry if i if i um bought this um this current government if i bought it as a product and mm-hmm. i had the receipt i would take it back because it's not it, it's not what i would as a center center right voter it's certainly not what i would be expecting because they were wanting a a um a slightly ever so slightly left of center vote but not as far left as the socialist labor party because certainly um i can't see even though they have a very strong majority i cannot see this government repealing or even amending the hunting act um from 2004 which effectively banned any intentional pursuit of any mammal with a dog there are very strict legal exemptions but again if i was vote if i had up until uh, where are we now 2019 the last election if I had the choice, right, between um, a Labour Party candidate, left wing, Conservative Party candidate, right wing, unless I knew that the Conservative candidate personally was against hunting with hounds, I would say it was a, you know, it's um, a good chance I vote for the Conservative candidate, the hunting, you know, um, hunting's going to be okay. I vote for the socialist. I know he's going to vote against hunting because that's how it is. Now, all bets are off. Yeah. There are many cabinet, you know, m- many members of the cabinet as well as backbenchers in the House of Commons that even though they're in the government, a conservative government, centre, centre right, they're not on our side they're not on hunting side so now this is where it gets very yeah the the, i guess that that leads me to be because really what one of the points i really want to kind of get out of this conversation um well let me put it this way when when we're talking culturally in in the, the just the 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 common I don't want to call it misconceptions. Just the common perceptions of the average person in in the UK. What what is that when you when you think about that and and you kind of have you know how you get this gut feeling about about how people feel about a certain topic. Um, you know, and, and for, like for example, where where I live, we have everybody knows, and we have this feeling of of, of politically where everybody's at. Uh, you go somewhere like San Francisco, and that's going to be totally on the opposite yeah. side of the spectrum. Yeah. So, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is when when you're thinking of like the the general population in the UK what is the general or or consensus kind of feeling towards hunting what is the attitude towards hunting um certainly in rural areas it would be um certainly they would be um supportive um they may not be um very um when i say supportive they wouldn't um 25 percent supportive and then um say um 80 um 70 70 percent um in the middle they have they do not hold a strong view one way or the other and i think this is where um in terms of you know, with sort of hunting, um, 
when I talk about hunting, you know, hunting with hounds in this country, um, we are so behind the opposition. I mean, they've had best part of 50, no, 60 years um, running ahead of us um, because they've been able to play the alleged cruelty. Ch- um, you know, they've, um, they've been playing alleged cruelty. Yeah, the emotional um, argument. You know, yep. Exactly right. Exactly right. And of course, if you're t- if you're walking down the high street somewhere, even in a rural town, and you know you're somebody who's running a petition comes up and says, "Oh, you know, um, can I ask you about blood sports? Not you know hunting or um, you know anything that you're sort of um, field sports, but they actually start making it. But just their questioning is very emotive. Mm-hmm. Then that is how it is a thin end of the wedge, so that when 85, allegedly, 85% of um, the UK populace is opposed to hunting with hounds, you probably find that 90% don't actually know anything about it. 85% that say that they're against it, they have, that's what they've been told. Mm-hmm. That's that the same here. It. Yeah, that's the same here. Yeah. The, the anti-hunting, the, the folks that support anti-hunting organizations are generally... Um, I, I don't mean I, I'm not trying to be offensive to by using this word, but they're ignorant towards hunting in in a major way, and and then that's oh, just the reality. Uh, and, and so it sounds yeah. like that's kind of the same concept there. Um, so now the result with what you with what you guys have been going through is you have no uh, actual hound hunting. Oh, we can keep hounds. We can yeah, take can them out them. and run centrals with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. But in terms of a, um, how will I say a um, killing an animal, the pure form, the pure form of us, you know, um, taking a pack of beagles across um, some ploughed land and putting up a brown hare and you know hunting her till they either um, work out all her um, her tricks and they um, kill her with a, a quick snap and that's that or they lose the scent altogether, you know, huh. that is no longer possible. Because again, when they drafted the law, and I don't sort of want to get into the minutiae, they actually felt that it was um, it was less cruel um, to be able to flush to a bird of prey using any number of hounds than actually let the hounds kill their quarry themselves. And again, it's a case of sort of, um, you know how they say that um, a horse designed by a committee turned out as a camel. Well, that's what we've been working with since February 2005. What about... When you put, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I cut you off there. Yeah, but when, uh, when you put, and again, a, a cultural, um, you know, a cultural totem, an emblem such as somebody wearing a red coat on horses that does not translate well with certain sections of the community as i say it is a a tribal a tribal image yeah. but again you you then bring into um you bring class into it that is also something which the opposition are very quick to play on and as what, I do said you, earlier, what do you mean by that the the opposition well, plays on the again, on like your class. You have to see. Yeah. Um, uh, compare and contrast. High fence hunting. I, if I've got um, whether it's um, in um, the United States or Canada or um, certain parts of Africa, if I have the dollars, I can hunt what you know what I want to take. And again, it's. It's that difference that it's like the difference between yes, I will put in for my um, hang on, um, my big game combination license in Montana, please yeah. God, in a um, couple of years' time, mm-hmm. and we'll see how we get on. I'm going hunting to learn how to go elk hunting. If I'm successful, you know, if whatever's legal comes in front of me. I will take and 
please God, make the best shot that I can. But the fact is, is I could go a few miles down the road to a private ranch and pay significantly more um, for a private hunt, then yes, that is an option. That is an, an option I choose because that's my own personal choice. Yeah. And I think that it's this idea that the perception as opposed to the reality, certainly um, anything to do with hunting with hounds um, in, um, in the United Kingdom is that you have to be rich. It is the pursuit of um, the upper classes. Um, but that's, yes, that's not the still, case, though? Um, it, not as much as it was. Hmm. Um, yes, there are still members of the aristocracy um, hunting, um, hunting the hounds. Um, but again, certainly world events such as the Second War it has leveled the playing field. And again, being both pragmatic and practical, um, as I said earlier, whether someone's a duke or a duchess or a dustman, if they love their hunting, um, good for them. You know, I, I really don't have any, um, oh no, we can't possibly talk to, the, uh, you know, um, talk to him. He, you know, he's, he's not, yeah, not quite our type of person because yeah. that is what that is what has done the damage to our way of life yeah this this idea that oh um they should know their place yeah and yeah. again it's, it's the world of difference between perception and reality If you're anything like me, hunting is a year-round thing for you, and we're always thinking about how to make our next upcoming season a little bit better, and one way to do that is with gear. And you guys know I'm not a big gear junkie, but I do have some important gear items that I'm always a huge fan of, and they're right here available on this show. Let's talk about Scree gear. Scree is my go-to camo. Scree is high-performance hunting attire and gear, scientifically tested camo patterns, and all backed by a great company, and I wouldn't recommend it to you if I didn't truly believe in the Scree product. They've got a complete layering system for all terrain and conditions, gear designed to adapt to the weather. It's rugged gear. It's got a lifetime warranty, VIP sizing and exchange program. You can't go wrong with Scree. Get the best out there without breaking the bank, and to make it even better, use promo code the Western Huntsman for 15% off and free shipping. Hell of a deal. Check it out at ScreeGear.com. Next on the list is my oldest and fondest sponsor of the show is Phelps Game Calls. One thing I love about companies like Phelps Game Calls is the American success story that came out of it. And Phelps started in Jason Phelps' garage years ago, and it's now one of the premier hunting call companies on the market. And I wouldn't point you in that direction if I didn't feel like they were the best calls available. Jump on phelpsgamecalls.com. When you find a call you like, use promo code HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off. I promise you, you will not regret it. Hoffman Boots. Hoffman Boots is a go-to uh, boot company I've been using for years and years and years. And the cool thing about it is I'm only on my second pair of Hoffman Explorers. I put lots of miles on my Hoffman Explorers. They're a great boot. They're not going to cost you a small fortune to get. And they have all the same guarantees and warranties that every other company out there has. If you want to be confident, guys, do not skimp on boots. Go to HoffmanBoots.com get you a pair of, I, for, for me, I like the 8-inch Explorers, but they also have the 6-inch. They have all sorts of different options. Check it out at hoppinboots.com and use promo code HUNTSMAN10, all caps lock, for 10% off. And last but not least is Tacticam. Are you interested in filming your hunt? And are you interested in helping with conservation efforts throughout the uh, North American continent? Well, then I got a deal for you. Tacticam is a point of view type kind of camera that records in 4G. They also have other products like the Film Through Scope, the FTS, and you attach that to your rifle scope and you can film your shot right there. 
and they have the mounts for your shoulder, for your head. They can, you can mount it to your bow. You can mount it to wherever and whatever you want. Lots of versatility with the Tacticam. Other products include, but are not limited to, the fisheye camera. The Tacticam Spotter LR is definitely worth a look if you want to film what you're seeing through your glass while you're actively hunting and get it on camera. It's a great thing. But I think that the thing that I'm most excited about with Tacticam this year is the new Reveal uh, cell cam that is coming out. This kind of this trail camera <clears throat> will send you images in real time as they're coming in. They've got like an enhanced antenna for better service. If you're like managing property or something like that, or you've got a bear bait set up somewhere that you have phone service, you can get those pictures right there to your phone. This uh, cell cam is super, super cool. I'm really excited about it. And you can get all this at the westernhuntsman.com forward slash gear. Go to the gear shop. You'll find all the Tacticam stuff right there. Uh, best pricing out there on it. And uh, what happens is we split the uh, profitable revenue from these sales of the Tacticam gear. And half of it goes to conservation efforts, uh, which vary depending on what quarter of the year it is. Right now we're raising money and trying to get some money over to Sportsman's Alliance. It's a great cause. And that is what's going to go down when you shop for Tacticam gear at thewesternhuntsman.com. So go over there and check it out and get you a camera. Guys, let's get back into it. I sure appreciate it. One thing I would just add, so with, with my bow hunting hat on, there wasn't as, well, there wasn't a bow hunting culture in this country, which is why, yes, the, you know, the culture were hunting, um, hunting with hounds, hunting with a shotgun, you know, hunting deer with a rifle. But again, when it comes to archer equipment, you know, certainly um, English archers have had a pretty good record, Agincourt, Cressy, but certainly after the Second War, um, when they brought in legislation to protect deer from being decimated by any means of take, it meant that um, in the Deer Act 1965, archery equipment was just omitted. It wasn't prohibited. It was just omitted. Someone from, you know, there was no one representing uh, British bow hunting interests. And then as time went on and, you know, sort of hooligans started taking pot shots at ponies with crossbows in the late 70s and early 80s, yeah. then archery equipment was prohibited as a means of take. And it's been that way since. So, again, between the two parameters of cultural identity as um, sort of the those that follow their hunting you know by going hunting with hounds you automatically have to be exclusive and rich through to you you have to be um uh some sort of a some sort of a bloodthirsty hooligan yeah. that can't be trusted with your weapon between those two parameters in many many circumstances that is what has framed certain pieces of legislation and that is what we're having to work with so they and again at the same yeah and and, and let so, so through legislation you guys there there is i, I just want to clarify this because and forgive me for i uh, again using this word ignorance um i am not super familiar with with laws and regulations in in the uk um i've never thought about going hunting in the uk <laughs> right so Oh, um, no, no, but again, you would be more than welcome. But I, I tell you this now, Jim, it would be, it would, 99.9%, it would be on private land. Yeah, yeah. And I want to I want to talk about just like a clarifier yeah. uh, with bow hunting. Yeah, sure. Uh, on, a, on a very basic level, is bow hunting legal in the UK? No. No. Okay, and I'm I'm clarifying this for the audience. So so essentially, it, it is very very limited hound hunting, um, and and there is no bow hunting. So what type of hunting is available in the UK 
for for like the general yeah. uh, we're, we're not not aristocracy or anything like that just just a an average individual that wants to go hunting what is available in the united kingdom um certainly in terms of um as i say it's sort of endeavoring to recreate a more pure form of hunting with hounds within the law, quote unquote, yes, that is still um, an option. And again, um, thank God, we have prevailed for the last um, 16 years now. But again, that is more through bloody mindedness than um, any immediate sight that the law will be well even amended let alone repealed now um, in terms of bird hunting there are a number of options and again this goes through the the range of very you know very um high-end blue chip options where mm-hmm. yes you would be you know looking to drop several hundred dollars for you know, the one gun to um, to shoot for the day, there'd be a, a team of eight of you, but it would be um, very, you know, it would be very high end, you know. It, and again, yes, I will use the, I must use the word exclusive because it is. But again, it's, like I say, it's the option between over the, ta- the, ca- over the counter tag versus a private ranch. You, at least you have that option. Um, again, in terms of um, what we refer to as deer stalking, deer hunting, um, because we have some of the um, tightest firearms legislation in the world, getting your firearm certificate so that you can go um, hunting for deer, that is quite limited in scope. But what we're finding now is that if you wanted to come over to, um, say, Scotland, um, there are a number of estates where you can use um, what they refer to as the estate gun, so that you, um, Jim Huntsman, does not have to go through um, the trials of um, getting your um, getting your weapon checked in, getting it over, getting it cleared, all of that. You literally get yourself across the water, you turn up. Um, somewhere in Scotland and um, they will provide a weapon for you yes it will cost you that bit extra but in terms of that experience um, you know this is something that I think that there are a number of um, you know an, a number of the sporting agents shall we say they're sort of booking hunts for people you know they are they are seeing this as um, as a ways to I say add value to the experience so you've got um, the other, I mean, you've got um, driven grouse shooting, which is, um, it really is the creme de la creme because you can't rear grouse. They are either there or they're not. And yeah. the, heather, the heather upland is, um, yeah, I, I think it, it, in effect, it is um, an ecosystem in of itself. It does need to be managed, but in terms of the conservation benefit as an ecosystem, you know, it is, um, Theodore Roosevelt would have got, he, I'm sure that um, he has made reference to it in, in one of his works, but it is very, very important. And again, if the opposition aren't, you know, aren't having a pop at the, um, at the rich and idle for going hunting with hounds, they're having the pop at the rich and idle for going grouse shooting, even though there are people who will scrimp and save, even if it's just a couple of days on a smaller grouse moor, they will they will scrimp and save so that they can have their um, they can have their um, their grouse shooting experience for those couple of days. Yeah. So yeah, we do have we do have options, but again, it's just the the other thing is the United Kingdom is it's not as big as um, North America, of course, but sure. also in terms of incre- increasing popularisation, 
Um, you know, we've got the thick end of 66 million people. You know, if you see those, you see those um, satellite photos of sort of the world at night and you, you see the United Kingdom and from sort of below Scotland and, and sort of east of Wales, there isn't a lot of dark patches. Yeah, down yeah. in the southwest, Devon, Cornwall, you know, the far southwest of England, that's very rural. You know, there's rural, there's, um, there's rural country, mm-hmm. sort of rural areas um, where I'm living out sort of um, out to the, the, the east coast, the north coast. But, you know, every sort of um, certainly around London, up around the, the Midlands. Yeah, there, there's a lot more tarmac and concrete than there's there's grass and trees. Yeah, there, so there's a lack so of land down. and there's there's a lack of hunting opportunity yep. due to regulation and the anti-hunting movement yep. and, and all these things that have taken yep. place. And uh, the the biggest question that I wanted to ask you before before we wrap this episode up here. Uh, we might have to do this again, sure. Kenneth, um, is seeing how things have changed over the last 50 some odd years in the UK for you and what it what it's the, the point in which it's at now and then your perception or your observation of how hunting and, and culturally how um, you know in North America what we maybe take for granted sometimes, what kind of um, advice or or concerns would you express to people living in North America in terms of our hunting and, and the future of hunting for us? I think the first thing to do is, um, as hunting people, and again, this, this is across um, all forms of hunting, all quarries, all means to take all weapons is that yes we are all concerned and interested in animal welfare because that's how it works you know mm-hmm. the um, North, North American we work on the science not the emotion um, yep. the North American uh, conservation model the other um, important point is that animal welfare should not and must not be confused um, with animal rights because then that opens up a whole um, a whole nother can of worms and again it is so easy for our opponents they can be proposing legislation they're saying oh no this is for you know the, the sort of an animal an animal welfare bill when in fact the, there can be so many amendments made to it that it then renders um, certain forms of um, game management and game conservation, it renders it, it renders such management and conservation almost impossible. Hmm. And I think that, and again, I fully appreciate you have state legislation as well as fe- as federal legislation, and I think that that is a great bonus um, in the United States because states can then consider specific issues as a local level yeah whereas um in this country um i live in the county of essex we don't have an essex legislature i just have to write to our local member of parliament and he then you know puts it through to the relevant department of the government but then that is still um within uh, the legislation would only affect England. Yeah. It would not be specific to my county, in effect. And I think that one thing, and this is something that I've always admired and been very envious of, um, I can't say it's every state in the United States, but anti hunter harassment or hunter harassment, direct action, um, is something which hunting with hounds especially and latterly certainly in the last i'd say 20 years um bird hunting um has had to endure effectively um animal rights terrorists 
um, physically attacking those um, taking part in their their former hunting. Um, again, it's something which we've just endured. Yeah. Yes, there is legislation that is supposed to protect us, but again, I think certainly in terms of Second Amendment, um, that's a, another podcast in itself, but certainly <laughs> I feel that um, we here, um, we are constantly on the back foot, if you're familiar with that phrase, mm-hmm. here in the UK because we want to make a popular um, a popular front, um, if you can use that phrase, but I think that we just, we've said, look, we've just had a Pride Month but if I went, you know, if if, if I went sort of to um, our uh, the shop in um, our village here and said, you know, um, we've got our, our Hounds Puppy Show um, this coming Saturday, you know, anybody want to come and see the, you know, the, the the young hounds? Now, people would say, oh no, hunting's cruel, and then you get into the discussion, how do you know hunting's cruel? Oh well, because until you actually find that they have knowledge, it's that that difference again between perception and reality in the U S because there are more options and there are, there's, um, there, there's more opportunity. I think that, um, it is, um, it's in better, you, you know, must not take it for grant for granted. Um, but I certainly think, um, it's, you, you must you must continue to monitor the situation um, on a state you know both on a state by state and a national level. Mm-hmm. But I think it's just something which must you must you must keep you must not underestimate your enemy. Yeah, no, that's, that that is badly. well said. Yep, that is well said. That's a I great know. point. But yeah, I and, and especially I really like what you talked about with, you know, understanding the difference between animal welfare and animal rights, and uh, that that's a that's a really important. I have an idea that you and I should talk about later on down the road, uh, along that regard. Yeah, sure. But um, you know, that's uh, like you said. I my I I think my concern. Um, is going to be that that our hunting populace here in the states and in Canada, you know, may be asleep at the will at times in terms of, you know, just uh, we we go through the year looking forward to hunting season. We get our tags, we go out and we hunt, we share a few pictures here and there, uh, and, and everybody enjoys it, and then they get on with their life, and and they're not paying attention sometimes to some of the things that pop up that threaten the future of hunting. And these things that that can kind of you know the, the death by a thousand cuts that that term that we use yeah. quite a bit these little pieces of legislation well we're gonna we're gonna ban hound hunting in California and then that's gonna kind of move into uh, banning yeah. hound hunting in Oregon which is going to lead to more legislation banning any kind of mountain lion or predator hunting uh, and, and all these things that they they take the ones that are easy for them to market yeah. to the to the populace the the population of people that don't know anything about hunting it's easy to make a case that hound hunting is so cruel and hunting predators and bears and mountain lions and all those things it's it's so cruel and and this is why and this is why we need this legislation to ban it to outright ban it and then from there if that happens and that spreads then it starts uh, trickling down to other things, down to you know even something as simple and small as grouse hunting or rabbit hunting or squirrel hunting, those things uh, become easier because they've already made those steps. And so that's kind of one of the points of of what we try to do here yeah. is is make people help people be more aware of how that happens and talk to people like you that have watched it happen in the UK. And and can offer some of the yep. insight that that I think we're lacking. We we need this this kind of insight to understand how that happens and takes place. So, uh, Kenneth, I I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I, I, I oh go ahead. Are you do you have some final thoughts there? Yeah, no. I I, would, I was just going to I was just going to um, uh, uh, commend you, Jim, on um, an excellent um, summation there because that very neatly encapsulates that sort of um, yes, I know it's a state by state. Um, consideration, but 
viewing, you know, the satellite view? Is it a sort of, as you say, um, a death by a thousand cuts? And it it just makes you sort of you put it into perspective. Yes, um, um, I'm very grateful for what we have here um, in the UK, such as it is. Yes, it could be better, but uh, with you know glass half full kind of thing. It could be a hell of a lot worse. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, oh, what was his name? Um, the vegetarian during the 30s. Oh, yeah, Adolf Hitler. Banned hound hunting. <laughs> you yeah. think of that. And I love, I love dropping that one. If you've got a real, real balls out vegan artsy going hammer and tongs at you, you drop this sort of, you drop the Hitler bomb on them. That floors them. Yeah. That really does not end out <laughs> their sales. That's a great again, piece of information. Well, you know, um, it's only so you could keep all the hunting for gerbils, you see. Mm -hmm. But there we are. Um, but again, it just, we, both sides of the water, yes, there is a lot of work to do. But again, um, we've learned to our cost. And I would say it's in, um, across all forms of hunting, but the majority of which would be hunting the hounds, but certainly um, in terms of, um, never underestimate your enemy. And just because you have a government in power at that time who has said they won't do anything against you, they might not do anything for you, but do not take political inact inactivity yeah. for granted. Yeah. You know, Great point. What, it's just, you know, um, we don't have crystal balls, if you pardon the expression. But certainly in terms of just doing what we can with what we have, mm -hmm. I think we just, um, mm -hmm. you, you just cannot, um, you cannot be um, blasé just because last season was okay. And, you know, there's no reason to think that there won't be some change in public land ownership that's totally going to change where you go hunting. You know, there could be changes, as I see, uh, the Montana tags for um, outfitters, etc. Mm -hmm. That piece of legislation, yep. yep, that could then affect people like myself who have the choice of using either an outfitter or, or going DIY as a non-resident. Again, it's a very small matter, but you start the snowball effect, and again. Um, one person I would like to recommend, um, for a European view, a very um, um, knowledgeable Spanish bow hunter by the name of um, Pedro Ampuera. You can find him on the Instagram. And again, um, he's travelled very widely to um, to bow hunt. But Spain allows bow hunting. Um, we, and it's the comparing and the comparisons. Uh, you have sort of um, contrast rather. And I think that that would be um, useful as well because seeing it from sort of another perspective, yes, we're sort of in Europe such as it is, but I I do go back to the, the point that we cannot be blasé. You know, um, we, we cannot underestimate our opponents because, um, you know, they, they do want to, they do want to, end what it is we do and what we love doing they certainly do Full and they're, they're well funded and well organized so yeah and okay. one thing i would just reiterate they are they are anti-people not pro-animal yeah <laughs> that's it as we've seen some of it i like you know, that I, i'm going to steal that expression can't... kenneth <laughs> yeah so please do I, yeah. if you if you want to horrify yourself just just google um or go on YouTube, hunt saboteurs. You'll see them dressed up like wannabe Daesh, you know, black head to foot, running around, um, beating people. And you think, now, how is that helping animal welfare? And again, 90% of the time, it's class warfare. Yeah. Plain yeah. and simple. For sure. So again, it's that's that's exactly that, that there is something to be said for the the level of class warfare that takes place in the hunting you know with with pro hunting versus anti hunting so 
Kenneth, I really yeah. appreciate your perspective on all this. This has uh, well, no, uh, been eye-opening for sure. So thanks for coming on the show, man. Well, um, and again, and um, I hope you um, settle into your, um, your your new dwelling, um, and yeah. that uh, the 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 current um, the current hot weather doesn't get um, too dramatic. <laughs> it's it's looking like it's going to calm down here, so we're uh, we're in yeah, good as long shape. As, long as, it's not, as long as it's not um, sort of a hundred degrees and rising. Exactly, and we need some rain. We need some. I don't know about you guys, but we need rain over here. Bad. Up in my neck of the woods, so yeah. So, so, so understand. Well, see if you can get that nice. See if you can get that nice, Mister Trudeau. Send send some across from Canada. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, Kenneth. Look, thank you ever so much for your time. Thank and, you. Um, that your interest in how things are this side of the water, and um, we, we'll keep in touch. For sure, I'd love to get you back on again in the future and, and kind of expand on some oh, of the, well, the basic po- points. So. You have a great night. I, I hope I didn't keep you up too late. And uh, oh no no, uh, we'll it's, talk it's, soon. It's, it's, it's chocolate. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Kenneth. Great stuff. Thanks. Bye for now, Jim. Goodbye. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.